As I trudge through Afghanistan's Maizan River Valley on what would be my final combat patrol, I stop for a second to catch my breath before climbing an earthen embankment. I had to keep my guys out of the riverbed and off the roads where we were easy targets, where the locals like to bury bombs. You know, they didn't usually like placing IEDs in and around their homes. So to hell with the roads, I thought. We took the safest route through their fields and farms. None of us wanted to be the latest casualty in a forgotten war. And no one was trying to be a hero, especially on our last mission. I took a breath and looked at the fields ahead. An acre of red poppies danced playfully in the breeze, and the craggy mountains cast a looming shadow over some mud-walled homes ahead. I marveled as the Afghan cliffs slowly swallowed the most beautiful sunset I'd ever seen. You know, it'd be kind of pretty if it weren't for all those shitty houses. <laughs> the river was a light show of colors. It was littered with crude mud-walled homes, dirt roads, and the scars of centuries of war. I was captivated and sick of it. I miss my home, my wife, and my pug Roxy. I missed having a beer after work. Mike got wrenched over the decision I knew I had to make, but I wasn't sure if I was ready to. I wasn't sure if I even wanted to hang up my boots and say to goodbye to life in the infantry. After a seven year, uh, after a seven year long love-hate relationship with the Army, most of which was spent overseas, I realized I love seeing the world, the camaraderie, the experience of serving, but I'd long since grown weary of the caveats. I was at the end of my enlistment, and I had to choose, re-up or get out. I wanted to stay in, but I was tired. I was tired of saying goodbye to my wife, tired of keeping my family at a distance, and I was tired of keeping a guilty list on my growing, uh, a guilty tab on my growing list on dead friends. I longed for a normal life, and even though I didn't have any idea what the hell that even meant, I just knew that it had to be better than all this. But I loved what I did. Training soldiers, leading them through combat. It was the most rewarding experience of my life. I love the guys with whom I served like a family. And being a grunt, it was all I'd known since I was 19. I wondered if I should just accept the fact that this, this was my life. I watched my soldiers following in formation. It had taken countless hours of training and a year at war the turn was once a gaggle fuck of misfits and teenagers into an effective fighting force. <laughs> I smiled proudly, and I kept walking. As I stepped, I twisted my ankle, and I ate shit. Gravity jerked my body one way and sent the 90 pounds of gear, of gear I was wearing violently in the opposite direction. I sailed to the ground like a bag of bricks. You all right? My platoon sergeant half giggled through my radio. <laughs> This'll buff out, <laughs> I answered, still spitting out pieces of Afghanistan while I spoke. <laughs> Miss this? Shit. <laughs> Let me count the ways. I dusted myself off and kept moving. 
I reached the edge of the scarlet morphine farm and climbed a wall to the next one. It too was filled with poppies planted in neat rows. Whoops. And as I climbed, my mind wandered back to scaling walls and fighting house to house in southern Baghdad a few years back. It wasn't anything like this. Back then, we'd quickly climb crude walls, rush into half-ruined homes, and race to the rooftop. Entire neighborhoods would erupt into gunfire. My heart would race as I clutched my rifle's grip, my eyes and sights racing rantic frantically through the haze of incoming lead and the confusion of trying to tell who was just trying not to get shot. Who was trying to kill us. I thought of the adrenal rush as bullets sang just overhead. That carnivorous dread that gnawed at our sanity and how we fought through it arrogantly. I thought of the couple guys couple dozen guys that didn't make it home, and the couple dozen more who were broken, blown up, shot. I remembered how the rest of us were left to pick up the pieces of our lives, to carry on and fight in their absence. The dead? They're the lucky ones. I was still coming to terms with my first homecoming from war on the eve of leaving Afghanistan. I relived old firefights by night and avoided them by day. I was so neurotic about my guy's safety because I was tired of seeing young Americans die on forgotten battlefields in wars that no one back home gave a shit about anymore. Screw this, I thought. I led my squad through the second poppy field and onto a small dirt road that was within eyesight of our mountain home. After a year spent battling the crags and my convictions, I walked the last few painful, muddy steps with my chin up because I knew that at least this time, everything was different. I knew I was still dealing with some old demons but at least this time, I'd managed to keep my shit together. I'd trained and led my guys through 12 months of combat. And this time, I was bringing all of them home alive. And most of them were still in one piece. I did my job, and I was proud. I looked at the faces of my soldiers and counted them as they walked through the concertina wire before keying my radio for the last time. Hey, two, six, two, three. We're a hundred percent. Roger that, two, three. Welcome home. I stepped into our sandbagged outpost and I smiled proudly. The next day, I again counted my guys as they boarded a CH-47. It was our ride out of the bomb-laden mountains and back to Camp Disneyland, otherwise known as Kandahar Airfield, or CAF. CAF. It was our next stop on our way back home to Germany, where we were stationed. I remembered my first awkward homecoming, and I wondered how long it would take me to adjust this time. I closed my eyes and I listened to that helicopter clamor through the desert dawn. And I thought of red poppies. Later that night, a few of us went out to explore our interim home. Compared to our forsaken outpost, CAF was a five-star resort and we fully intended to enjoy ourselves. We bought cigars and pizza we reminisced about humping our gear over mountains, getting rained on, eating expired MREs, all while the assholes stationed on calf has such plush living conditions. 
Fucking A, huh? Yeah. That Leviathan Air Base, it had USO shows, contractor-run dining facilities, and even a fucking weekly salsa night on the boardwalk. No, no bullshit, an actual boardwalk. It was lined with shops and restaurants. Man. Afghanistan. Individual experiences may vary. I joked and I chewed my pepperoni pizza. Mm. Man. Our 12 months had truly sucked. But it had paled in comparison to the combat I'd seen in Iraq years back. I remember the burned homes, dead kids, friends losing limbs. And I felt stupid for complaining. I'm just happy we got everybody here, I said. And I chewed in silence for several minutes. A greasy pizza and a Coke. I was in heaven. And that's when my platoon sergeant's phone rang. It was one of the soldiers in our platoon. I could hear the panic voice. It's Spalding, the voice said. Spalding's been shot. What, what, shot? It didn't make any sense. We were miles away from any real combat and we were on the eve of going home. We scrambled to our feet and out the door, clutching our rifles as we ran, and my heart raced. Two have stepped into the road and tried to flag down a passing bus. It wouldn't stop, so we raised our rifles. It stopped. <laughs> All he managed to hear, my platoon sergeant took a deep breath, was that Spalding's been shot. He sighed heavily, and that Baker did it. Baker? He was another soldier in our platoon and a close friend of Spalding, and none of it added up. He said something about they were playing. His face cringed. And that the Baker shot him in the head. We got to the combat support hospital, exactly as the Humvee arrived that was carrying our wounded soldier, Riley Spaulding. His face was covered in blood-drenched gauze. I could see that he'd suffered a point-blank gunshot wound to the forehead. My mind raised with questions, but the reasons why were still fuzzy. Only the trauma was clear. I watched four corpsmen carry Riley Spaulding onto a hospital bed and quickly wheel him inside. We followed closely. As they pushed the gurney, th the gurney through a doorway, the bloody bandage fell from his face. He's not going to make it, I thought. We watched the frantic doctors do their damnedest but it was no use. It was too late. <laughs> I looked at the hole in Riley's forehead. It was too much. God damn it. I stuck around to fill out the paperwork. What the fuck, Spalding? I looked at his vacant eyes and I choked back tears as I signed my name, officiating his death. He was a lovable goof, kind of like a little brother. And now he was dead. A week later, the rest of us were back in Germany. We landed at Ramstein Air Base near Frankfurt 
and then loaded buses on our way back home to Vilsec, where our lives that were interrupted a year prior had left off. I stared out the bus window at the thick green pines and rain-soaked Autobahn. I didn't know what to think about these carefree civilians who were driving beside us. They were, com they were completely oblivious. It was so odd not to worry about bombs in the road. It was weird, really fucking weird, to be so close to home. Because suddenly, it wasn't such a vague concept. I thought of what it was like last time going home, and I shuddered. I wondered what it would be like now. This time, everything was different. I thought about Riley Spaulding. We were less than an hour away.